Greetings, Captains. I am Yisrael, and welcome to the first in a two-part look at a cheap and cheerful cruiser build. A bit of background first. A while back I did a video covering how to build an escort on next to no budget by using mission rewards and a minimum of energy credits. A recurring question ever since has been when I'm going to do something similar for cruisers and science vessels. Thing is, for escorts it was simple. An escort's ongoing mission is to seek out new life and new civilizations, and to boldly shoot what no one has shot before. Cruisers are a bit more varied. It was simpler at launch, cruisers were basically engineering heavy tanks, but in the last couple of years things have broadened out. Between tactical and science heavy variants, cannon armed battle cruisers, flight cruisers, dreadnoughts, and the heavy Dideridex and scimitar warbirds, which are both odd enough to warrant their own categories, trying to cover all the mission roles a cruiser can take with one video is basically futile. So we're going to go back to basics. An engineering heavy tank, no dilithium or zen involved, and a minimum of energy credits while aiming for a build that's going to be able to handle normal queues and probably elites if the captain is careful. The hull we're going to be using in this video is the Mirror Universe Star Cruiser. If you're newly promoted to Rear Admiral, then the regular Star Cruiser has the same layout, but otherwise the Musk is available for energy credits and uses the Sovereign hull for its appearance. Prices are usually around 500,000 DC, but that doesn't stop people trying their luck on the exchange. For shields, Impulse Drive and Deflector, we're going to the featured episode Step Between Stars. Three times, since you can only get one item on each run through. The set is pretty solid for basic tanking. It incorporates a resilient shield array, accuracy and structural integrity bonuses on the deflector, and a rather handy proc effect on the engines that can boost speed and agility when hit by enemy fire. The weapons fit, however, is something of a compromise. My personal preference on cruisers is for disruptors. The proc benefits everyone on the team by cutting the target's damage resistance. However, there's really no good option for disruptors on the Starfleet mission track, and matters are further complicated by the lack of any good tactical consoles. The best you can get are uncommon directed energy distribution manifolds for beams, and uncommon pre-fire chambers for cannon. So we're going to have to compromise a little. The revamped Fluid Dynamics episode has a reasonable anti-proton beam array as a possible reward, with accuracy, critical chance, and damage bonuses. Okay, that last bonus isn't great, but you can't have everything. If straight accuracy is your thing, then there's a double accuracy anti-proton beam array available through Sphere of Influence. However, we do want six of these arrays for the build, and Fluid Dynamics is a lot quicker to run. Besides, we'll be hitting Sphere of Influence anyway for both the seventh weapon, the Omnidirectional Anti-Proton Beam Array, and the Obelisk Subspace Rift Warp Core. These two pieces form part of a set that gives a 10% boost to anti-proton damage, and that goes some way to making up for the lack of a good tactical console. The final weapon in the fit is a forward torpedo tube, which I'm including partly out of tradition, partly to counter aceton devices, which require kinetic damage to kill, and mostly to give a second damage type without adding to the energy drain just in case. Conventional torpedo tubes don't work very well on this build. Most have a cycle time of 6 to 10 seconds, and not keeping the target constantly in the forward 90 degree arc will mean lost damage per second. Not an issue on an escort, but cruisers in general are slow to turn, and this build in particular has most of its firepower on the beam arrays, so it can often be 20 to 30 seconds between firing opportunities. However, there are a few torpedo tubes that are less affected by this problem. The Harkpeng torpedo from the Doomsday device has a 15 second cooldown, which is just about manageable, comes with an inbuilt area of effect attack, and doesn't have to worry about point defence shooting the projectiles down, while the Tricobalt and Cluster torpedoes from Out in the Cold have 30 and 45 second cooldowns respectively, which gives a fairly generous manoeuvring time between shots but can be stopped by point defence. However, the cluster torpedo, when it works, packs a solid punch even through shields, so that's my first choice unless the opposition are prone to using point defence abilities like fire at will, I'm thinking Voth and Tholians in particular. Under those circumstances, go for the Hakpeng. Consoles? Yeah, 
it's a sad fact that Federation missions are behind the times when it comes to consoles. The best tactical console available from missions is the uncommon Mark 11 DDM, which gives a poxy 16.2% to beams. For reference, the equivalent beam specific console, anti proton in this case, is the uncommon Mark 7 anti proton mag regulator. Actually, the Mark 7 is slightly better, it gives 16.9%, and the Mark 11 uncommon gives 24.4%, but DEDMs are better than nothing, so pick two up from Secret Orders in the Klingon Arc, or Suspect in the Cardassian Arc, if you can't get mag regulators either from drops or dirt cheap off the exchange. Science consoles are in a similarly bad place. There are science consoles worth having. Power insulators are useful against enemies that use shield draining effects like the Borg. Field generators add extra shield capacity, which is never a bad thing. And emitter arrays help with active shield heal abilities, but these simply aren't available through the mission system. And crafting, well, crafting might eventually get to the point where these consoles are readily available, but I wouldn't bet on that at the moment, and you certainly won't be building good quality versions yourself on any practical timescale. Which leaves random drops, as always, and the exchange. But as a stopgap, we're heading off to Beta Ursae and Tier of the Profits, since that rewards a rare shield emitter amplifier. Extra passive regen. Well, like the tactical manifolds, it's better than nothing. But you can bet that's going to be one of the first consoles to get replaced. Engineering consoles. Well, on the bright side, you can at least get some decent power boosts and armor from the mission system. Seeds of Descent rewards uncommon power consoles, will take two of the field emitters for some extra shield power, and Secret Orders, again, rewards an uncommon neutronium alloy console, which is solid all-around armour. So two of those as well. Again, there's better available through the exchange or as random loot. In particular, an RCS accelerator would be handy to help with turn rate, although juggling cruiser commands can work in a pinch. As far as devices go, well, there's nothing much of note. Weapon batteries are cheap, freely available, and handy if you need to come charging out of full impulse and immediately get everyone's attention. But one particularly handy piece of kit is the subspace field modulator rewarded from Skirmish. This is basically a panic button. It gives you a boost to defence and damage resistance for 15 seconds on a 3 minute cooldown. The downside is a significant vulnerability to proton damage, so for the love of all that's holy, go careful with this, especially around Tholians and PvP, since there are far more proton damage sources than there were when this thing first came out. That more or less sorts out the ship fitting itself. For the bridge and duty officers, we're going to go with what's known as an auxiliary to battery build. The core of this build is the technician duty officer, Specifically, the technicians that reduce almost all active bridge officer cooldowns by a percentage when auxiliary to battery is triggered. What some bright spark worked out is that you can have up to three of these duty officers active and the effects stack. With three cheap common grade officers, 4% each, that's a 12% reduction in cooldown times every 40 seconds. Each increase in quality level adds 2% reduction, so 3 uncommon officers, 18%, 3 rare officers, 24%, 3 very rare officers, 30%. If you were wondering why the very rare technicians come in at 15 million energy credits or more, and the rares come in at 1.5 to 2 million, well, now you know. However, those are way over the budget, so we're going to go for uncommon officers, typically about 100 to 120,000 each, and we're only going to resort to common grade if the budget is really getting tight. The remaining two slots are more to personal taste, although I would suggest a maintenance engineer to reduce the cycle time on engineering team, and a warp core engineer for the possible power boost to all systems when you're using emergency power. Other possibilities are hazard system officers to get some extra mileage out of brace for impact, and if you're a science captain then consider a sensors officer, since they will upgrade your sensor scan ability to slap a 6 second damage debuff onto the affected target. With the duty officers sorted out, it's onto the bridge officers. As a broad rule, if you can pull it off, get yourself human bridge officers. They come with the leadership trait, making for faster passive repairs to both the hull and subsystems. 
Saurians are also worth a shot to begin with since they have the efficient trait and that adds a bit of extra power in low priority systems like engineering and auxiliary, but once you get some better gear, especially a plasmionic leech console, that bonus becomes less useful. The Lieutenant Tactical Station is a no-brainer. Tactical Team 1 gives you boarding party clearance, automated shield rebalancing and a damage boost, while Beam Fire at Will 2 gives you area of effect damage, some point defence against heavy torpedoes, and that little bit of extra pain, and thus threat generation for every enemy in range. The science stations are similar. Hazard Emitters 1 gives you some basic hull healing, but more importantly it cleans plasma fire, which is handy against the Borg, while Transfer Shield Strength 2 provides a decent shield heal and a little bit of hardening. The second ensign slot is open to taste, but against tractor happy enemies like the Borg, the Tholians and occasionally the Romulans, I would strongly suggest Polarize Hull for the immunity to tractor beams it provides. Actually, Polarized Hull is generally good anyway, since the extra hull resistance helps if a shield facing is about to go down, and all your shield heals are somehow on cooldown. The core of the build, however, are your two engineering officers. For the ensign slots, emergency power to shields 1 is fairly self-explanatory. You get a little bit of shield healing, the extra power boosts transfer shields, passive regen, and shield hardening. Emergency power to weapons might seem a little more unusual, but the extra 10% damage and power helps with the threat generation, and the power also restarts weapons taken offline by beam target weapons or similar, something the Tholians are very, very fond of doing. For lieutenant slots, we're loading two copies of auxiliary to battery, unless, and I stress, unless you don't have access to an engineering captain with six ranks in the repair skill, in which case take engineering team two instead of one of the orgs to bat powers. Why do that? Because along with reverse shield polarity two, giving you a panic button if it looks like your shields are about to fail, the second lieutenant commander power is engineering team three. This is an exceptionally powerful hull heal, about 10,000 once captain skills are taken into account, and it also restarts any disabled systems. The problem is that engineering team three isn't obviously available. To get it, you'll need to either be an engineering captain with six ranks in repair skill, or else know someone who is to provide the training for your bridge officer. If you can't get your hands on engineering team three for whatever reason, then the contingency plan comes into play. Take engineering team two as a lieutenant power, and take auxiliary to battery two in the lieutenant commander slot. This trades off a bit of healing ability, not great but not fatal either, but has the advantage that both powers are cheaply available through the Bridge Officer Trainer. For the Commander power, Aceton Beam is probably the best choice for pure tanking. Rank 2 is available through the Bridge Officer Trainer, while Rank 3 appears on randomly generated Engineering Officer candidates, uncommon grade or better. The radiation damage is a minor thing, but handy since it goes straight through shields, but the real selling point is that rank 2 will reduce the victim's energy damage output by 2 thirds, and rank 3 by 3 quarters for 30 seconds. Pick the opponent with the biggest guns, slap the aceton beam on them, and life gets a bit easier. And that, Captain, brings us to the end of part one of this guide. The ship's fitted and ready to go, the officers are in their stations, and in part two we'll take a look at how this ship handles in combat, and some of the ways the design can be upgraded from the baseline. Until then, farewell. <laughs>